Normally, the all access stories, for those of you who aren't aware, are just stories that I give you from games that I've covered, and it's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So I figured I'd go a little bit further back to a time before I was even in the sports media business. I wanted to be in, I dreamed about being in, but I wasn't in. So if you are familiar with the Iron Bowl rivalry, it's the Alabama-Auburn rivalry, uh, I don't really care if you think it's the best or not the best, irrelevant. It's, it's very, it's crazy to be around. Whether you observe it or you cover it, it's crazy to be around. So if you've ever seen some of that home surveillance video from places in California when there's an earthquake, and you'll see like the, the swimming pool. If you've ever seen what an earthquake does to a swimming pool, that is the Alabama-Auburn rivalry. That earthquake hits, and the, it's, it's just like a bowl. And if, if, you, if you kick a bowl full of water, that's exactly what the earthquake does to the swimming pool. The water just goes back and forth, back and forth. And that's exactly how the Iron Bowl rivalry really has always been. And it was no different in the late 2000s. In the late 2000s, um, start around 2006 or 7. Uh, Auburn has run off six straight wins. 07, I think, was the last win in that streak for Tommy Tuberville. Alabama has gone and hired a guy named Nick Saban. And so then Nick Saban starts winning, and he runs Tommy Tuberville out of town. And then in this game right here, actually, that Colin's showing you, look at Glenn Coffey go. Um, Alabama won that game 36-0, humiliated Tommy Tuberville. He's fired. They bring in Gene Chizik, who was 5-19 and 19 at the time. And so it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So let me take you back to that pre-Nick Saban time. Let me tell you where I was. All of you remember where you were during, I get, if you think like me and you're a big college football fan, you think about where you were during big moments in the sports history. So I've told this, or I've referenced many times where I was. I was working at a fabric warehouse down in Columbus on uh, 12th Avenue for those familiar down there. And Mike Shula gets fired. And then it's that period of, ooh, who are they going to go after? And everyone knows they want Nick Saban. But Nick Saban gives the, I'm not going to be the Alabama head coach deal. So then they put Joe Kynes in the interim position for the bowl game. And they interview him at halftime. It sounds like someone cranked up a leaf blower. It's just, wah. So Joe Kynes is not the guy. Bless him. Bless him. Great guy. Just not the guy. And so Nick Saban has given him a no. I mean, guys, do you remember the names? I, I remember this, and here's what it has to do with where I was working. I would listen on a little teal blue radio every day. I would have an earbud in as I was stacking these rolls of fabric. And I remember listening to talk radio all throughout the day and hearing names like Paul Johnson, Jeff Tedford, Rich Rodriguez. It sounds like there's breaking news. We've got a deal in place. He's going to be the head coach at Alabama. Then all of a sudden you find out maybe his wife is not so gung-ho about it as Rich Rodriguez is, so now he's out. And so now it sounds like Nick, it sounds like Alabama's down to their ninth or tenth option. Not much unlike Tennessee went through a few years back. A few years back, Tennessee was going after all these folks and reportedly kept getting told no. So that's where Alabama was. But then they circle back, and they go back after Nick Saban, and they get him January 3rd. 2007, I am Indian style with a clipboard on my lap, filling out inventory for rolls of fabric that have just come in off the southeastern freight truck. And there's the breaking news in the earbud, Alabama finalizing a deal with Nick Saban. So because I'm passionate about the SEC, it's huge. It's, I, I felt the same way, well, maybe not quite to this degree, but when we found out Jimbo Fisher was going to Texas A&M, I mean, if you feel like A&M's been mismanaged like I do, and you're getting a national championship winning head coach to go in there, that's exciting. Because if you love SEC football, if you love major college football, I grew up in the SEC, so it's SEC for me. Uh, you guys know about the lower back tattoo I have, allegedly. So it was a big deal. So then that stuff starts to unfold, okay? Here's what I, re I realized not maybe from his introductory press conference, when I knew things had changed at Alabama was there were some folks around town that you could always count on to get information from Alabama. And then all of a sudden they didn't know anything anymore. And what happened was a lot of people who had loose lips had been disassociated from the program. So there was no information coming out of Alabama anymore. And all of a sudden your little sources, you know, down on the corner of Ninth and Broad at the restaurant you go to on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they don't know anything anymore. That's when I knew things at Alabama had changed a little bit if you didn't know just by the identity of the guy they had hired. So then Nick Saban starts building Alabama to what it's going to be. So then a couple of years later, I was telling Colin about the YouTube video earlier. Tuberville's out. Auburn's looking for a head coach. Swimming pool. Back and forth. 
And you can look this up. I didn't know if we could use it, if we had the rights to it, but you just, after the show, preferably, just Google um, Auburn Gene Chizik Airport or YouTube it, and you'll see. A lot of you remember what happened. Auburn is rumored to be going after Gene Chizik for their head coaching position. He is, at the time, 5-19 and 19 as a head coach, and um, a guy shows up to the airport, Jay Jacobs, athletic director at the time, and some Auburn uh, uh, dignitaries, if you will. They fly up there, they fly back, and they're getting off the private plane, and there's this dude. You never see his face. He's just off in the distance somewhere, just yelling, boo, we need a leader, not a loser. That's what he was screaming. Five and 19 is not what we need. I wrote down quickly his suggestions. He wanted Turner Gill, he wanted Brady Hoke, uh, Patrick Nix, he threw Rodney Garner out there, but he said five and 19 is not what we need. He was adamant. Of course, two years later, Gene Chizik won a national championship at Auburn. Say what you will, Gene Chizik won a national championship at Auburn. That guy was never heard from again, or was he? This is where the story really gets interesting. I finally get my break, and someone finally puts me on radio in Columbus. It is, I think, 2012 or 2013. So Chizik's already gone. I mean, he's been fired. They've won a championship, he's been gone. That's how quickly the, uh, the old swimming pool, the water goes back and forth. There's this guy, obnoxious Auburn fan calling into our show. Now, I loved him. He went by the handle Pauly Walnuts. The Sopranos was big at the time, obviously. So he goes by the name Pauly Walnuts. So um, he would call in, and it was good-natured, but, you know, he'd rib you back and forth. But, I mean, the guy was out to lunch with a lot of the takes that he would have. And he was a dude who, in spite of all the logic you would throw at him, he would listen, nod his head yes, and say, yeah, but I still think the way I think anyway. Well, I'm driving into the station one day, and it occurs to me, because I had thought for a long time, I know that guy's voice. I know his voice. And then it occurs to me, I don't know what was happening. I was driving down Winton Road in Columbus. I don't know what hit me or how it hit me the right way, but it did. And I said, that's the airport guy. That's the lunatic from, excuse me, that is the young man from the airport. So I go into the studio, and all the guys who were working there, Pun, Bobby Z, all these guys, I pull up the YouTube video. I say, tell me if you recognize this voice. I press play. They all, to a man, said, that's, that's Paulie. That's him. So he called like every day. So Hazmat, our producer in radio, later did a late kick with me in Columbus. I have him with one of the audio pods reserved, and he's got that video pulled up, and we're going to ambush him. And sure enough, he calls in, and sure enough, he's mouthy, and sure enough, we, we ambush him. Say, hey, you ever heard this before? And it was as, we couldn't see his face, but it was as if he had heard a ghost. And he stammered all over himself, and we never heard from him again. So we went from Indian style in a fabric warehouse to ambushing a caller on a local sports talk show in Columbus. That is what the back and forth, the volatility of the Iron Bowl rivalry did for me professionally. Did you think that was where I was going? Probably not.